Father, we worship you. We, we love you. We love you, Lord. This isn't our church. It isn't my church. It isn't my ministry. This isn't ours, of ourself. This is yours. Father, if, as you've left the seed in the earth, and you've given us this call, and we praise you and we thank you more than we ever have for Jesus Christ and for his shed blood. For everything that he's given us, it all goes back to him. Every prophecy before him and every prophecy after him, everything circumvents itself back to one truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, crucified and risen again. Everything, everything is built upon him. All the Old Testament prophets that ever lived, every revelation of the old, every revelation of the new, everything is concealed in one, one man, one God-man, this man, Jesus Christ, the author of eternal life. We give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the price that you paid. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that you're here this morning to share this uh, <coughs> celebration with us. Just what celebration? His love, His goodness, His life. If you're listening to this message and not watching, not present to watch, or watching on YouTube. We begin this message with me standing behind a pulpit that is draped with a very large American flag, stars and stripes, red, white, and blue, over the pulpit. Um, for the last several weeks, uh, this being the sixth one, we have been studying a message that we called bayonet training. Now it's not a militant message in the realm of physical militant. It's a spiritual militant message. And uh, it's a play on words, as I have said before in the past, but yet uh, still exemplifies uh, a message that exemplifies coins, brings to a conciseness of what we're trying to get across. And a bayonet being, of course, an attachment sword on the end of a rifle. It, it speaks of not just warfare, but it speaks of close encounter of warfare. And um, we've shared that uh, we've, we've given a long foundation of this, and I won't try to go into all of that. But for the last several weeks, at least one through five, was more of a particular subject in which we will go back to that subject next Sunday, the Lord allows. We have at least, I would say, three more services on that particular uh, vein. And we've been studying, um, not harshly, but very meticulously, uh, the subject of undescribed grace, undescribed by the Word of God, which we would call uh, critical, uh, critically in a I hope, loving way, and I believe in a loving way, radical grace, um, uh, a grace that is not described by the Word of God, uh, but yet is um, sweeping our nation and sweeping our world. 
and is describing uh, to Christian dumb um, something that is um, uh, very contagious because it's 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 radicalized by an extreme um, levels of truth, but it has an element of falsehood in there that can lead to, and absolutely, it's not. We're not investigating something that is. Uh, uh, is very benign. We're looking at something that is malignant in the body of Christ, and it can lead to a radicalism that is so far off the Word of God that it destroys. Oddly enough, one of the people that left this church years ago told me that uh, one of the men whom I have named uh, in these messages and given written report of where you find his material or where I found his material and quoted him verbatim. <clears throat> uh, the man that left said that this man, his book, and uh, my pastor, Dave Roberson, those two books helped him more than, than anybody has ever helped him. And I can understand why. In fact, I had a message prepared, and it's not thrown away. In fact, it'll be up on the docket next week um, to show... Um, another side to what we've been teaching over the last several weeks and show the 95% that is truth and which draws people in and really in certain cases can help them, but what it carries is it carries a gene of poison that eventually can totally destroy the true message of grace. Now I said all that to say this, we're taking another vein this morning uh, we won't be speaking necessarily about that. What we will be speaking about is what I said from the very beginning several weeks ago, is that this message of bayonet training, and again, bayonet training meaning the fighting will get in real close to us, even within the pews, and I'm not talking about this kind of fighting, I'm talking about doctrinal arguments. But this morning we want to talk about an awareness an absolute awareness. And I said part of this message, a big part of this message was blowing the trumpet, bringing awareness to the body of Christ of the end time and where we're at and, and, uh, and an appreciation of what our stand is and what we've been called to do, what we've been called to do as a church. But I, all, I use that uh, tongue-in-cheek church because we're not really a church. We are a church, but not really. We're really here to train uh, this can have a horrible connotation nowadays, but we're here to train radicals, spiritual men and women who really want to go somewhere in Christ. Kirsten walked out of the Wednesday night service, and uh, uh, I could feel that we had gotten the message across, and she said, Pastor, thanks for training us to be Navy SEALs in the Spirit. And I said, well, thank you. I appreciate the compliment. Because what we're here for is to teach people how to, in fact, last, the Wednesday before was how to get tough. And then the last Wednesday was how to get tough and stay tough. I don't know what this Wednesday is going to be. It's going to be like get tough, stay tough, tough, and get tougher. <laughs> Most of the church, a lot of, maybe I shouldn't stereotype too far. A lot of the church is so coddled. Honey, are you okay? Baby, is that all right? Did you get offended that there is no spiritual strength, manhood, or womanhood in the spirit? Nowhere near ready to face tribulation. Nowhere near. Because there's so much arguative spirits, so many uh, voices of opinion that need to be made when people do not know their Bible. Listen, people, me and Homer, I hope he gets on it tonight. He's going to be ministering. I don't know what he's going to be ministering on tonight. But, folks, don't take my word for it. Please go home and read this as much as you can. This is what makes you strong. Ultimately, I am to broadcast this. I am to be a catalyst, Homer to be a catalyst. We are, from the pulpit, we are to prone you, prod you, encourage you, do whatever we can to get you in front of this word and read it for yourself. That's the, the enzymes, the vitamins, and the nutrients of you getting stronger is dependent on not you listening to me but listening to what I'm saying about this and encouraging you to fill your own self up. 
That's how you get strong. Well, I listen to him and I listen to her. You're weak. You're just, you're just a pretzel in the spirit. I, how much time do you spend in front of the, uh, you know, well, pastor, I expect you to get it for me. You'll fall apart. If I go to the emergency room and your child, your grandchild is in there and they're saying, we give them a 50-50, you're, you're melted like a popsicle on the 4th of July if you do not have this inside of you. You're screaming and crying. And I, I've been in those places with people. And I love them and I don't chase them. I just won't have you in the room. Now we can kiss and hug and I can, we can make up later. But if it's one of my kids, you're not, you're, if you're an emotional person, you're not going in there with me. I'll apologize to you later for being rude, but I'll be rude for the moment and say, you know what, we can't have that emotion. And, oh, Jesus, please. No, 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 no. No. If you know how to go in there and fight and pull them out of... I don't need your emotion. I need power. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I appreciate y'all being with me. <laughs> We're going to take a, a slight a directional change this morning and uh, speak somewhat of this. I'm pointing to the flag and, and, the, and the precepts behind it. And really go to Scripture. We will have Scripture before the day's over so you can feel like you have been in church. But I appreciate all of you. I can feel you're, you're with me, and I do appreciate that. Um, praise be to God. Hallelujah. There's never really been a time in my life, and I give this all to the glory to God, of, to God and appreciation to you uh, for your prayers. Um, when you do think of me, pray for me. When you think of Homer, pray for, for us. There's never been a time in my life where so much was in front of me um, and I give all the glory to God so much in front of me as the Word of God. Um, there, at this point in time, there are weeks of lessons already prepared in my heart. That you know, I, And a lot of times I'll be, I'll be teaching this lesson, but I'm three weeks ahead or four weeks ahead, trying to just can't wait to get to you uh, the Word that, that is in front of us. And so I appreciate that so much. And that's not a brag, that's a, an invitation to say to all of you, you're all candidates of the same. In whatever field you're at, and wherever you're at, God wants to fill you up and keep you full. Praise the Lord. Um, this is a call, it's an awareness to everybody in the house. Uh, if you're here this morning and you're not born again, um, uh, there's certainly going to be opportunity in this service for you to do that. And we will explain how to do that, how to give your life to Christ. But this message this morning is about change. And I want to read to you um, some things that I have written down and gleaned. I've written this myself and gleaned over uh, the last couple of days of some things that I have read and studied or restudied, knew, but restudied, and then caught some things that I did not know uh, uh, Amazing enough, and if there's teachers in here or historians in here, uh, you already know this, and uh, you're, you're, you're already in appreciation of this, but I want to read some things that I, that I have discovered or that I've rediscovered over the last few days. 240 years ago this day, on this day, the Second Congressional Congress was in session. The meeting had started on July 1st, it was comprised of 56 men from 12 of the 13 colonies. They met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to discuss the tyranny of King George III. This tyranny had reached incredible levels with sufficient uh, or significant, rather, battles having already been fought between the colonists and uh, the British Army. I think there had been a couple of really significant ones. One, Bunker, Bunker's Hill had already been fought, although an official war had not yet been declared. During four days of deliberation, a document was composed uh, to express the convictions and the resolve of these 56 men. The primary composer of this document was a young man of just 33 years of age, Thomas Jefferson. 
The document came to be known as the Declaration of Independence. This document was not signed on uh, July 4th, but rather ratified by the attending delegates. The actual signing did not take place by most of the delegates uh, until August 2nd. I believe that the Declaration, this is my personal conviction, is a document that was inspired by Almighty God, not on a, the level of the eternal uh, Word of God, but to, it, but to the building of the fabric of what makes up our foundation as the United States. It is one of the chronicles that make up what could be called or termed the Bible of the United States, along with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. When these 56 men did sign this document, some uh, at different times, to them it was a pledge of their life. Uh, these were distinguished men, some of wealth, some who would later become actual presidents of the United States. Signing this document would mean their death warrant if they were to lose. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Declaration of Independence was not the end of the war with England. It did not signify a total independence from this perspective. No war had already been fought and won. To declare this independence was only the beginning of the war. Declaring their independence from the tyranny of England was something they purposed in their hearts before the Revolutionary War had fully begun. This decision would prove to cost the lives of thousands of Americans and British men alike. It would mean going up against the most powerful military army or force on the earth. Yes, to me, perhaps the most inspiring line of the entire doc document, uh, at least co-equal with the one that said all men are created equal, is the closing statement of the document. Because I think about what revival cost. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Glory. Yes, sir. For the purpose or for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Of the 56 men that signed this document, they meant what they said. Twelve fought in battles. Five were captured and imprisoned. Seventeen lost their properties. Five lost their fortunes funding the war. Uh, they had if you've ever heard the expression, you'll hear it several times during this message, they had skin in the game. What does skin in the game mean? That means you have an investment in what you say you believe. You're investing. These men put their fortunes, their names, and their lives into what they believed. They, put it, they, they totally sold out to it. Tomorrow's July 4th, you know that. Uh, happy birthday, Davy, tomorrow. Davy's a firecracker baby. <laughs> she really is, right, Watson? She sure is, he said, Papa. <laughs> I, I, I want to say this. I'll digress for just a moment. I, I would highly recommend, you've heard me say this before, and you know my stand on, you, you know, uh, movies and different things, and I'm very intolerant to uh, severe language and especially sexual things and those kinds of things. Uh, I do go to movies, but I, I watch which, one, which ones we go to. Um, but these are old movies. I would highly suggest that you 
and your children that come of age who, who have uh, uh, grown to a maturity who can differentiate and process. They've got to the place where they can process. I would highly recommend that you watch and at different times in your life repeatedly through the years watch two movies at least and there may be a number of ones. One is Schindler's List. Uh, very, very, um, it's a very hard movie to watch. A uh, lot of F words, a lot of uh, cursing God, uh, but I would highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. I would highly recommend that you have your children at when they become young adults, uh, when they can process these things, watch this. Um, it is the story of a man um, who, uh, it's a real life story of a man who in um, Poland um, did as much as he could to save um, the Holocaust victims and those that were uh, being exterminated on a continual basis. And I would also recommend, I would highly recommend uh, Saving Private Ryan. Huge, tons of F-bombs, tons of GDs, but I would highly recommend it. I probably will watch it tomorrow because I want for it to ev forever be inevitably stamped inside of me what these men paid for the price of our freedom. Somebody said war is hell. It is hell. It is absolute hell. There's nothing pretty about it. Um, Schindler's List. Now, I have toured. I have a book in that room. I have a bunch of pictures in it. It's a historical book, but I, the pictures and my f personal photographs of me standing in places. I have toured Auschwitz, Auschwitz I and Auschwitz II. It's uh, actually Auschwitz, and then some people uh, just call it all Auschwitz. I, it's Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II. Auschwitz I is the original Auschwitz, and then Birkenau is just 15, 20 miles. I can't remember how far down the road. Uh, I walked into those places uh, prepared, I thought, but unprepared. As I toured those places and watched what um, Hitler, the atrocities that he had committed on mankind, um, when you walk into Auschwitz, uh, you walk into this gate that has an iron uh, rail above it, and it says, uh, not in English, but in, uh, it's probably German, work sets one free. And they told an incredible lie to uh, the prisoners. They said, we're bringing you here. They, they gathered them from all over Europe and all around the world and all over Poland and brought them into that place. It's a huge camp. Um, I've walked into the crematoriums. I've walked into the places between Auschwitz I and Auschwitz II, and they, they estimated six million people, or six million Jews, died under Nazi Germany, Hitler, 2.4 to 4 million of them died in those two camps. And in other words, I walked into the places. I would walk in. Uh, I knew I could get out. But still, the horror of what you were walking into, the, the crematoriums or the, the places where they would gas these people, some of them would, you'd walk underground and you'd walk into like a... Um, like a dungeon, cave. Uh, some of them were about the size of this auditorium. There were no windows, only, only like one door in. And no windows. It would be, of course, pitch dark. And we went into places where it was really dark, and that's really creepy. And uh, the only light would be the light, of course, where you would enter in at. And they would pack them in there like sardines. And there would, you would notice there would be sprinkler heads 
on top of the ceiling. Uh, once they packed them in there as sardines, they would then, women, children, young, old, uh, then they would turn these, they, they, they actually in the beginning they told them they were, they were taking them in there to shower them. Um, the, the, the men and the women would be totally naked. There was, there, the shame uh, would be horrible standing there only in the next few moments to die an agonizing death uh, with something that was comparable to uh, rat poison but would be vaporized and sprayed um, out in the air. Uh, I don't know how many in Auschwitz won. It was the smaller camp died. Maybe millions, hundreds of thousands. To walk into a place where you know hundreds, and then I, you, know, you walk down the street a little bit, all these dozens of barracks, and then uh, you see a wall, probably just no bigger than the wall that is in the back of the church where the, uh, the, the sound people are at, where maybe thousands were, were shot. If they didn't gas them, they had so many different ways that they were killing people. They would line people up, and I walked to the back of the, that wall. Uh, uh, of course, it would just, you know, that's where they, they just, they would line them up and just massacre uh, I walked into other places where they would have them in holding cells and they would hang them in there for, for God only knows what reasons. And they would take like what little wire hangers like we hang up our clothes with and choke them to death as they're, they would just hang there. The most horrible part, I cried. I cried maybe times during that day. I think the most horrible place was where, where we walked in and to the place where uh, uh, the, the, the angel of death, the, the, the doctor, uh, Dr. Joseph, uh, what's his name? Yes. How, say, say it again. Mangala. He was uh, an experimental doctor, and the horrific thing was he did this on children. The experiments that he would do they would, in life, with no anesthesia, he would remove bones from their body. He had an infatuation, uh, a sadistic, demonic infatuation uh, uh, for uh, twins. He would uh, take pins and put in their eye to see all kinds of it while they're unsedated. Uh, he, would, he would join. He, he would sew twins together. He would uh, put people in, uh, adults and children, into hypothermia, into ice water to see how long uh, it would take for them to die. So the experiments were to, to actually be transferred over to the, to the fronts to let uh, people know, um, they said, what human uh, beings could be conditioned for. Um, when I went to Birkenau, Birkenau down the road. That was the big one. You, you can't imagine how big it is. It's almost unfathomable. It just goes on forever. It's not like a little, it, it's just huge. It's just, I mean, almost like as far as the eye can see, you're just barracks and barracks and barracks. Well, that is the tunnel of death where the train rolled through and then when they got him off, uh, someone was standing there to decide who lived and who died. If you're old, uh, if you were crippled, if you had any uh, sicknesses at all, uh, you were pulled to the side, machine gunned down. Um, uh, they were looking for a certain working class, and uh, they, they hauled off those certain working class. The, 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 these barracks, when you walk into them, uh, men and women, um, some of them were segregated men and women, but they, the latrines where you use the bathroom was just right down the middle. There was no privacy. It was just a trough. You just squatted there in the trough. Millions of people died uh, uh, just of the cold. Hundreds of thousands have died of the cold and the starvation um, uh, during that time. It, it, was a, it was a horrible, horrible time. Um, in 1946, um, I, 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 at June, I have it here in front of me. I'll look at my notes. That'll help me. In 1944, June of 1944, D-Day, um, 
was instituted. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower was the commander uh, of all of our forces in um, that theater, and he commanded the invasion of Normandy, France, in which 156,000 primarily Americans, Canadians, and Brits, which we once fought, um, invaded with us. They invaded on five different beaches. Uh, those beaches I, I have written down here. Um, those beaches were the, the Utah, the Omaha, Gold, Juno, and the Sword. Thousands. Uh, the, the, um, the Nazis, the Germans, had fortified. They had invaded France, taken over France. And the only way was to go in there to, to stop all of the atrocities that were taking place in these killing machines. This man, this insane man... Uh, took it upon himself once he, once he went through and there was a change of governments and finally went to dictatorship where he's the actual god of the nation. Whatever he says goes. His, one of his supreme goals in life uh, was uh, to eradicate the earth of, of all Jews. He wanted the last Jew killed on the planet. These concentration camps were killing them by the masses and he almost achieved that. Our Normandy invasion led to thousands and thousands of American boys. If you've ever seen Save It Private Writing, that is, that is, that's graphic, but I can tell you it's not even graphic enough. If you think any of these are Hollywood, Hollywood doesn't do it justice. It doesn't do it justice. The appre appreciation factor, listen, um, I'm not mad at anybody. I don't hate anybody for doing it, but if these guys would ever, anybody of any nationality that's ever come to America, if you spent a day, well, maybe not, maybe your heart's so hard you, just, you, you wouldn't care, but if you had to spend, I wanted to say if you spent a day at Birkenau, you wouldn't pee on the flag. You wouldn't pee on it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't burn it. Because it cost men their lives to free those people. Um, when Normandy was invaded in Juno and, and Sword and Omaha probably took the greatest hits. These men, uh, these Germans had placed themselves in well fortified. In fact, for days there had days and days there had been just blanket bombing and it still could not it could not get them out of those pillboxes that were so fortified it, it would not destroy them. So when the actual soldiers on the ground took those beaches, uh, it was just a battle of attrition. It was just how many bodies could you throw at them until you got to the top. That's it. I mean, and there was thousands of young men that never came home that gave their life to free people. Now listen, <laughs> I'm a man that's fighting for revival. Uh, I will, I believe, I'm, hit, I'm not saying I'm there yet, I'm saying I'm giving my life to the point that I believe that one day, if I had to, there'd be a grace on me to give myself in, in martyrdom for the name of Jesus. But in also retrospect to that, I will say this, having toured those atrocities and looked at them face to face, if a country or a madman breached our military and came to the shores of America, I would stand along with our military and fight like a madman. You would see a preacher, Rambo would be a sissy. <laughs> would you bear arms? I would proudly, before Almighty God, bear arms and fight and fight until they killed me. I would fight. I'd carry a Bible in my rucksack, but I would carry an M16 and I would fight. Having seen those atrocities, people, a price has been paid for our freedom. A price has been paid. Listen, the love of God never takes you away from defending the innocent. It never does. I had a man years ago, not anybody that really, that you would know so well but sat in that office and asked me a question. I was astounded. <laughs> I think he thought that he was thinking in the love of God. He said, 
I don't know what I would do. You know, I don't know how to handle this quandary. It was before service, so I didn't go into it. He said, I, I don't know what I'd do uh, if uh, someone was about to, a young man or somebody was about to rape my daughter or my wife. I don't know if I should act. I didn't get a chance to tell him, but I would tell him <laughs> if I could in a very polite way, sir, I will act for you. I will take your judgment. If you're concerned about the judgment, I will take your judgment. I know him. I will fight. I will kill if necessary for the justice of the innocent. Any man that would not defend his wife or daughter <laughs> doesn't understand the love of God. I've toured Auschwitz. I've toured Birkenau. And yet, contrastly, I'm giving my life to save the unjust. Hallelujah. What an incredible dichotomy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you still with me this morning? We're still going to get to the Word of God. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? Um, our fathers had skin in the game. Everybody say skin in the game. Now, you know what that means. It means an investment, right? Our forefathers through the wars had skin in the game. Uh, I had a man. <laughs> I don't know if he'll ever watch this. I don't even know if he knows what's going on over here. If he does, he'll hear this in love. I had a man recently visit me. Uh, well, several months ago. I think he was on a road trip, and he had some people with him. He had a... He had rode his bike over, his uh, motorcycle over, and uh, he wanted to pray. You know, it was impromptu. I didn't know it. He, 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 he wanted to, he was some, I think, I, I've met him maybe a couple times years and years ago. I think maybe he had good intentions. I don't know. But he, he come up to the house impromptu. Can I talk to you? Yeah, yeah. And there's people, there's, you know, motorcycles out in the, in the drive. Yep. Can I, yes, sir. Okay, because I'm going to be nice to anybody. That if I possibly can. And you want to pray for me and you want to prophesy over me. Okay. I, okay, if you want to prophesy over me, okay, that'll make you feel good. That's fine. <laughs> you know? Okay. But, uh, and then he, you know, and he, he did preface by telling me I'd helped him at some messages that he had heard. I appreciated that. But then he was leading up to something. He led up to uh, Ezekiel 3, you know, uh, he was telling me about the witchcraft in this area. Okay, okay, okay. And he was telling me about, you know, the natives here. Okay, okay. And he said, if, you know, the Ezekiel 3, if you don't tell them, but he didn't say Ezekiel 3, I know, I'm, I know where it's at, but Ezekiel 3, if you don't tell them, then your blood is going to be, their blood is going to be reti re required on your, your hands. So, okay. <laughs> I said, uh, yes, sir, I've been, I've been fighting for this for 20 years. Oh, and then he backed off. He didn't, he didn't say any more. Listen, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not up here. I'm going to sit down there with you because many of you paid the same price. We've been paying a price, skin in the game, for 20 years around here. Uh, I've set up nights fighting spiritual battles. Uh, you, you too, many of you. I've went... Many, 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 many nights fighting things in my body. Things I've had, uh, I've had different things, uh, procedures done to relieve me from pain that I've never told anybody. But we got past them. We've had fastings and prayers. We've had multiple people leave. We've had generals leave. We've had general leave, generals leave. I've had two administrators leave. Just said, I, this is not, you know, basically, I can't hang on for, to revival anymore. And it's not just me, it's you. I've fought battles w with my family. Listen, we've got skin in the game. We've got 20, 20 years. Listen, if you're, <laughs> here's the deal. If you don't have skin in the game, Pastor, you're going to be nice, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> Now, I'll, I'll sit out in front. There's a pasture down there. It's uh, past Jefferson, past Newmarket, past whatever that last road is. 
Madison? Okay, it's past Madison. There's a pasture down there, and uh, there's a, there's a, I'll say it nice. There's a donkey down there, okay? There's another word for it. <laughs> there's a donkey down there, and there's several of them. There used to be. Now I don't, don't hear him so much. Uh, and you know what? Amazing enough, here in southwest Florida, if you ride by these pastures and you see all these donkeys, you know what they're for? A lot of you do. They're to defend against the coyotes. All the ranchers nowadays have, have, are buying them. And they find that these, these uh, short little donkeys are extremely aggressive. And the invasion, and we have a lot of coyotes. We have panthers uh, that have been so protected now they're escalated. These predator animals that'll come in and eat the, the, uh, the newborn calves, um, they will, they often, they have found that these donkeys will fight them and uh, they will fend them off when they come into their proximity. I actually, I, I, true, true to form, I actually sat one night and heard uh, a fight between, I, it was a pack of coyotes, and I, I know the difference. A country boy, I know the difference between coyotes and dogs. It was a pack of coyotes in that pasture, and I could hear that, that donkey fighting them, braying. Boy, he was braying like, and they were, and he was braying, and he was fighting back and forth. And those donkeys will run them off. They're, they're amazing. They're pretty amazing. And I used to sit, and I hadn't heard him recently. I hope he's still down there. I hope he's okay. Uh, early morning, uh, I would sit, and sometimes the fog would just be coming up, and I love the, the early morning sun c coming up, and, uh, and I'd hear that donkey, not fighting those, those uh, predators, but I'd hear him bray. <laughs> Wish I could do it. Man, he was loud. I'd say, Candy, listen, we'd laugh. He'd just be braying, braying, braying. Listen, if you don't have skin in the game, your prophecy to me <laughs> That donkey brain, now I could use another word, but that donkey brain means more to me than your prophecy to me about what I need to do for a mockley. <laughs> now, there are men in the world, and there are men in this church and women in this church, if they had a prophecy and uh, they, they thought it was from the Lord, I, it's not that I'm beyond correction. I just don't receive correction from anybody that doesn't have skin in the game. I don't, because they're not qualified. We, we need skin in the game. Everybody say skin in the game. Skin in the game. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to God. Well, true to form, I, we, we are going to get in the word for all you religious people. <laughs> no, no, I just said something about how powerful the word is. I, just, I mean that. Luke chapter 14. Hallelujah. Are you having a good time? Um, many, I will say this again, many have aborted, many have gone different ways. Um, some because revival hadn't started yet. Um, a lot of times it's an attitude of... Uh, uh, when are we going to have revival? How many have ever felt that way? I know I have. When are we going to have revival? When's this all going to start? Um, I've put my time in. I've put my time in. I, I will say this, just as an example of the natural to the spiritual. To the men that died in the battles on the beaches of Normandy, they did not know that anyone had ever reached the summit. They didn't know it. The ones that were laying face down dead in the sand or floating in the ocean, had no idea that the objective had been achieved. Many of the ones who took the summit later were killed in the invasion and never knew that Germany finally surrendered in the war and the war was won. These men were taught to do what? To fight with one objective. The objective was to win at any cost. Now let's look at a portrait of revival. Let's just look at uh, chapter 14. I'll try to read kind of quickly because I'd like to cover uh, most, if not all, of this chapter. And it came to pass, verse 1, he, that's Christ, went into the house of one of the chief uh, Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day. 
And they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? They held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go, and answered them, saying, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into the pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those that were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them which sit at meat with thee. For whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted." Then said he unto him that bade him, that is the host, When thou makest a dinner or supper, call not thy friends, or thy kinsmen, nor thy, kin, kin, or thy brethren, neither kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, and call, call this, now this is the call to revival, and this is the heart of Christ, although in just a moment he's going to call others first that does not fit necessarily this category, but will distinguish those. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the direction, or at the resurrection of the just. Now, why would you call, why would you call a supper and call the blind, the maimed, the halt, all these? What is the supper for them? Is it just to feed them? No. Spiritually speaking, it's this. This is our call to revival. And this is ultimately what we'll read in a moment, skin in the game. This is a commitment to do what we're called to do. It is to call them in to say a supper is being fed. Not the supper at the marriage supper of the Lamb, but he said this. He, was, he, he gave this parable and exemplifies this parable in just a moment. But why would you call anybody to come and eat if what they were supposed to eat did not fully give them the full satisfaction of whatever they need. In other words, blind, we're calling you into a place where Christ has come to the forefront. He gets to exemplify himself through something that we affectionately call res restoration, revival, whatever you want to term it. I really don't care. All it is is a reenactment of the book of Acts. That's what it is. It's the reinstatement of everything that he is in us and through us. Blind, come in here. Halt, come in here. Lame, and especially the lost, all of these coming in. We want to serve you a supper because by His grace, not by our own might, we've got skin in the game. We've spent the time necessary to qualify ourselves through His grace to serve this supper to you. In other words, bring them in because we can do something about it. Bring them in. We can do something about it. Now, we know we can get them saved. That's a spiritual aspect. Where it goes from the spiritual to the physical is where the church, as of yet, has not arrived in real magnitude. That the works that he did will do also, and greater, the greater was that we can get people saved now, because he, really Jesus could not get people saved until he himself became the prototype. Then he comes up, and then did, he did not do one miracle. Not one miracle after his resurrection. Jesus healed nobody. He turned nothing, water into wine. He did no miracles after his resurrection. Why? Because the delegated authority, the exousia of authority was then passed to the church. We then were supposed to be little Jesuses in the earth. And the greater work was we were supposed to say, here, come, look, prototype, get saved, get born again. Oh, but I can act like the prototype, be also healed in Jesus' name. The same power that got you healed is the same, or the same power that got you saved is the same power that's supposed to get you healed. If we can't get healed, it, if, now, it's, it's not that he's lost it or it never was, but if your belief is that you can't get healed, I don't know how that you can believe that you can be born again. 
because it's all one and the same. Salvation, soteria, is one word. It's all-encompassing. Now, you can die diseased and still go to heaven. I'm not saying that. But if your belief is, I don't believe God heals, how, ooh, how do you know you're saved? Because it's the, same, it's the same grace that heals and saves. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. So this is the supper. This is the absolute supper. And he said this in verse 15, And when one of them that sat at meat with him, he said these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, this is, he brings up the kingdom of God, so Jesus is going to talk about the kingdom of God here. A certain man made a great supper. He still, Jesus is talking about this great supper, and bade many. He sent to his servants at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are ready. And they all, this first group, these were not, if you'll notice here, they were not the halt, the blame, the mind, the maimed, uh, the deaf. These were those who had a wherewithal and seemingly had their life together and could have been the call to the administration of the church or the, the first, do, first call that would bring in the secondary call that would help administrate all the maimed, the blind, the halt. But listen and watch and read with me. This certain man made a great supper in 16 and bade many, and he sent his servant at supper time and to say to them that were bidden, Come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Now, you've heard me. I've exhorted this over the last few weeks. I can't get away from this. And he brings me back to this. In fact, I have another message prepared, but I, this exhortation came on me. This man goes out, and he's going to, he's going to solicit the workers for this, this supper that is about to take place. And this first one says unto him, the first one says, I have bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. And I pray, I, and I must go and prove them. In other words, I bought equipment. Uh, I mean, if you put it in the modern day vernacular, but equipment, I must go and look at it and view it. Um... He says this, um, another uh, said, I brought five yoke of oxen. I must go and prove it, prove them. I pray they have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And, and of course, there's any of those and all of those, and then we said this before, and uh, uh, I've, I've received your amens. You understand this. Those are all in and of themselves legitimate excuses. In other words, there's none of those per se sin. There's nothing per se sin about those. In other words, you can't find in the Word of God, in fact, if you're a called entrepreneur, uh, or a GE, we call them, gospel entrepreneur, or really goes back to the, also there's a coinciding scripture, uh, the operation of helps, that is a person of means. Um, and, and so it, maybe you have that call. If you have that call, your, your time is spent buying, investing, looking at your investment. All those semi wives, children, families, those are all wonderful things that can be instituted. But the only thing is, every one of these legitimate things then became something that kept them from their true call. It kept them from absolutely fulfilling. And what happened was legitimate, legitimate excuses became illegitimate excuses when they were given, and let's read the rest of it, when they were given in, in, in place of their highest calling, which was to be part of this great supper. And 19 again, is another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. It's 20. I've married a wife. 21 is where we're not yet. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said unto his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in the hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out of the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be full, filled. 
For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went out a great, and there went a great multitude with him. And he turned and said, now he's turning, they're going with him, but he's turning. He's like, here's an exclamation point. I have not finished my subject. I've got to tell you everything that I've said hitherto for also it brings me to this point. I want to tell you this point. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot me, be my disciplined or my disciplined follower, my disciple. Now, does that, does that hate mean, wait a minute, Jesus, you want us to love one another? Yes. This hate is not a vehement, I hate your guts because you've offended me. This is by a, a hate of love by way of comparison. Love by way of comparison. That's what is saying here. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Now, let me just pause right there. We have been over on this. It's been surfacing recently, and he's got to get this across to you. I pray to God he does. Listen, Jesus said, if any man that is called to this supper, he's got to lay his life down. And he's got, by way of comparison, to what? Because all of those were legitimate excuses. But the only thing is they kept people from fulfilling the highest call, which was to receive from their master the elements necessary to help serve this table. Not disregarding all the other things that they were part and partisan to as a mommy, as a daddy, as a businessman. But there's a higher call in which people oftentimes forsake at the recognition of what they believe is a legitimate. Listen, Abraham all his life wanted a son. God came to him and said, I'm going to give you a son. A real son that comes from you and Sarah. You guys, God, I want a son. Change your name to Abraham and stay out of Abram. Change it. Confess it. Look at the stars. Get a visualization of it. Isaac's coming. God promised it. He didn't. He got weak at one time, and him and Sarah conspired uh, to have a son with the bondwoman, Hagar, and you know the story. So, he prematurely tried to, to force the promise of God. Ishmael was born. Ishmael has always been a prototype of the flesh throughout the Old Testament. And even in Galatians, Ishmael is the flesh. It is what is born of the flesh. It is what propagated of the flesh. Isaac has always been a prototype of finally Abraham hung in there after Ishmael was born. And folks, Ishmael... The sons of Ishmael are where a lot of the terrorism is happening today. Okay, that, that was a bad mistake. Abraham, don't do it. Don't go in that tent. Don't, don't do it. We're going to have terrorists. But he did. That was flesh. But yet God had promised him, he had promised him something of the Spirit. He promised him Isaac. Isaac was finally born. And then Isaac was raised up. And you remember the message? Isaac became a young man. And after the promise came, then God tells him, go sacrifice the promise. What? Take the promise that I gave you and take it up there and kill it. What? Why, God? Well, all of it's a strong message of Christ. But the present tense message to Abraham was this. Abraham, not even a promise that I've ever given you ever should become your God. Nothing even of the spirit that has ever been given to you do you put before me. Abraham, do you love Isaac more than me? He took him up to Mount Moriah and he's about to come down with the knife. And God says, I see your heart. You love me more. I'm still your God more than the son that you always wanted. You get to keep him. Listen, I am convinced from us all, many Isaacs, things of spirit that have been given to us can become flesh. Isaacs can become flesh. Isaacs can become Ishmael's. 
In other words, if God gives you, well, God gave me this home. Yes. God gave me this business. Yes. God gave me this. Yes. But when you begin to associate with it, God gave me these children. Yes. But when you begin to do for them and go with them and do this and that, and they become a place to you where it takes away from the intimacy and the time that he's asking you to go to this word and spend time in it, wherever that is at, however you're called, you're not called to do what I'm called to do. You can't spend the hours, but he wants your intimacy. He wants skin in the game. And you can say, well, he gave me these children. He did. But they can become Ishmael's. They won't be Ishmael's, but they'll be Ishmael's to you. He gave me this business. I know, but you're spending the amount of time in it. He gave me this. Yes, he did. He gave me this pastime. Yes, he did. He'll give people pastimes. He gave me this boat. Yes, but it became a God to you. He gave me this business. Yes, but it became a God to you. Spirit can become flesh. The thing that you called into existence. These are my children and God gave them. Yes, and they are your Ishmael's. You're living for them. He said right here in Luke 14, every man must, by way of comparison, love me more. Abraham, do you love me more? Kill Isaac. God, you, <laughs> I confess for him for 50 years. I know, go kill him. You mean the thing that you gave me? Yeah, because I want to make sure that you always know that you love me more than anything I've ever given you. You got to have skin in the game. Hallelujah. If any man come after me and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brethren, his sisters, yet in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation, and it is not able, and he is not able, in essence, he and is not able to finish it, all that behold began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Same subject. Or what king goeth to make war? In other words, if you love him, then these things either will be granted to you, the wisdom, the building material, all the necessities to finish your life with prosperity and with uh, a prosperity towards those, those things that you continually keep in front of him. In other words, if you love your children, don't love them more than Christ. I, I, in a good sense, I say this. I worship my children. I love them in that sense. I, I, I think you understand my vernacular. I love my wife beyond comparison. But I keep, to the best of my ability, God first. Why? Because I love him. And then the other thing, too, I want this ironclad guarantee. I don't want anything in my life to become an Ishmael. Do you understand that? What king goeth to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he is able to, with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great while off, he sendeth ambassadors, 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 uh, and desired conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. We'll finish the chapter. But if salt is lost, his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dung hill, but men cast it out, and he that hath ears, let him hear. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, we're teaching you, he's teaching us to get tough and, and to stay, uh, stay tough. Um, I would say by this and, and, and getting close to closing, your, your life, this, we're not... This is a church. I don't want you to think we're some kind of cult. We are church, but we're more than that. We're a training facility. We're training people to get strong and, and, and get ready for the last days and also get to a place where we can stand strong and be a light to people that are going to go through incredible things. And not that we won't also, but we're, also, we're going to have the, the stability of the stalwartness, the strength of the Word of God inside of it. It's an ironclad steel, case-hardened steel that says, okay, wait a minute, I don't see it. Uh, many have come and gone and said, I don't see it. I, I haven't seen it yet. Listen, the case in point is this. The point in case is this. Uh, is uh, 
the people that fought on the battles of the Revolutionary War or in World War II, these were, these were incredibly uh, characterized men. They become characterized men because they were fought to go in there and fight at any cost. One of my favorite guys that ever came here was uh, uh, Jacob Easterly. I love that, that, that old guy. He's a, just a wonderful guy. And uh, I had some multiple conversations with him. And uh, just, just a man of extreme love and character. I don't know how many of you remember Jacob. He'd come in here. Uh, he's always flirting with the, young, with the girls. You know, he was always telling them, you're, you're my favorite. You're my favorite. Candy thought he was, she was his favorite. Uh, and uh, he, she thought that you know, they had something going for years. And uh, then he, she one day heard him tell another lady that same thing. And it was just a you know, man up, way up in his years. And he just loved God, and, and uh, I, I'd, just, I, I'd hear him talk about, and I'd hear him tell the stories, and, and I'd listen. You know, he said that he would be in those foxholes, dug in in Germany, and he would be fighting, and the, fi- you know, the firefights that they would have, and an explosion would take place right there. And he, he talked about how that he got prayed back by the women uh, that were praying in intercession uh, there, you know, just off from La Belle, and... and uh, he said that there, he, he, there were times that a man would die, would be killed instantly on his right and, and right there on his left. And he would be in this, in this fight. And, and, and I, I don't know, you know, Jacob very, very possibly had to take other lives. But he said men would die right there and they would die right there. And he would he'd be saved alive. He would absolutely be saved alive. And he gave all the credit to the intercessor, intercessors. Well, these were men of character. They put skin in the game. They, they invested something. Listen, uh, just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But listen, if, even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, if I'm here for no other reason to save the posterity of the integrity of the foundation of the founding fathers of this word, which is the word of God, if I'm here to save that with others and conceal it, listen, there's a place in the Old Testament where they found the word once again. It was concealed in a wall. If this generation continues to go where it's going, we're going to need sons and daughters that have the impregnancy inside of them of the true foundations of the apostles and prophets, the Christ Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And if we're living for no other hour so that we're putting in these guys to say, look, if we die before he comes with a great revival, stand strong in these doctrines. Do not take from what you're hearing from other fellow Christians that there's something that is undescribed by the word of God that's not a grace that the word of God truly describes. And yet the grace of God is so incredible. It's so incredible. It's what we live by. Let me, let me make a closing statement and then we'll be done. This invitation uh, is, is to all of us to be a part of a movement, a movement towards an outpouring of God's spirit like never before. Ask yourself, what is my part? Everyone here, ask yourself, what is my part? What can I do to add to this movement? Is it prayer? Is it prayer and uh, faithfulness uh, to continue to give? I remind all of you that have ever felt like you were called to be a giver. Please don't forget your call. Um, Is it a willingness to help? Is it a willingness uh, to uh, give just in moral support by showing up? Is it a willingness to spread his message uh, in any way possible? Listen, I'm asking you guys, not for my popularity, but I'm asking everybody to Facebook these messages. Let people know because they need to hear this doctrine. They need to hear this truth. And listen, there, there's, there's calls of please. <laughs> uh, intercessors, we need you like never before. We need you like never before. Givers, we need you like never before. Man your stations. Man your battle stations. Those that will show up just for, listen, I I can tell you of truth. It's easier. Now, believe me, if I don't do it, then it's my fault. If I don't stand up here and deliver the word of God, if I get discouraged, it's my fault. And and you're not going to be judged for it. But moral support, moral support. What is moral support? Just warming a seat, showing up. Well, I believe in what they're doing. If you don't show up and you can, you don't believe in it. You you don't have skin in the game. You don't have skin in the game. 
All you, now, but listen, if you just come every once in a while, please, you are welcome, and we appreciate it. And some have traveling distances that make up a, a somewhat of a variable in what I'm saying. But if you can and you don't, if you can and you don't, then <laughs> your moral support of just sitting there says, I believe in what we're doing. You're supposed to come to this. Listen, we are, where's that last? Let me, this is, this is my favorite part of this, maybe this whole thing. And for the support, this is what they said, those that gave their last. They said, and for the, the Declaration of Independence, and for the support of this declaration, in other words, what backs up what we're about to say, for the support of this, what are you, okay, you're going to write something on paper? Yes, we are. But for the support of it, what stands behind it in all reality is this. With firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, in other words, with a firm reliance on Almighty God, that's the first place. Man, these guys knew God. They knew God. We mutually pledge, all 56 of them, for four days deliberated. And some of them were like, should we stay loyalist or should we rebel? They finally decided there's no way that we can stay under this tyranny. We've got to go forward. They finally decided that. They pulled the trigger on it on, Mar on J July 4th, tomorrow, 240 years ago, that day, they finally ratified it and said yes they didn't sign it because they couldn't they, they had to copy it and uh, do different things but they said this we say this to all americans all colonists and let this message go to king george for the support of what we're about to say we pledge we mutually pledge to each other our lives our fortunes and our sacred reputations our sacred honor we give it all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Folks, if there's ever been a time, intercessors, stay faithful. Love your families. Men and women, stay faithful. Be good businessmen. Be good, but be, do all this. But listen, ask yourself, has anything that you have become what you feel is a legitimate a legitimate excuse. What's wrong with getting married? What's wrong with raising a family? What's wrong with buying a piece of property? Jesus basically said these things were condemned because they became an excuse not to go in and be part and partisan to serving up spiritually this table to the world. And that's where they became unjustified. Folks, I believe that through the grace of God, not only you, but myself and all of us will go forward, put skin in the game, and continue to be part of what he's called us to do with no excuses. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you this morning. Praise the name of the Lord. Would you please stand with me this morning?